Hey guys, this is going to be the part 2 of a video that I started making about a week ago. Um, I'll release both parts at the same time, so that's why you didn't see the first part up until now. So, if you didn't follow the first part yet, then I'll put it in an annotation about here. Yeah. So, yeah, watch part 1 first, otherwise it's not really going to make any sense. So Allah has told us a few things. And I want to bring your attention to those few things. The purpose of me bringing attention to those things is that you and I get to know who who is. First of all, who we ourselves are. And once we get to know who we are, by means of that we will get to know who Allah is. Who Allah is. So the, the Quran's argument begins with this. If you want to talk about the theistic argument or the argument about the belief in God, it begins from this point. So let's listen to your brilliant argument. Now the thing about this ruh that we learn in the Quran is that it was in Allah's company. That it got to meet Allah. It spoke with Allah. It had a conversation with Allah. And in this conversation, it spoke and Allah spoke. And both sides have been recorded in the Quran. I never understood how people can literally believe that God speaks or asks questions that are made of words. What, what, why would a God need to use something as trivial as words to, um, to speak with those magical spirit cloud thingies? I mean, they, using words is kind of trivial because we are forced to use words because we, the only way that we can have a conversation and pass information from one another as human beings is with our mouths because we evolved to a point where we could actually use um, um, setting your mouth in different shapes and different um, in different ways to make the air vibrate in certain frequencies so why the hell would God need to use such a primitive method of conversation Allah says to all of the ruh, there was a huge gathering of all the arwah, all the ruhs all together. And Allah asked them a simple question. Now at this point, the ruh doesn't have a question, do you exist or not? It doesn't have a question for God if whether He exists or not. Well, why doesn't it have that question? It's talking to Him. How do you talk to someone and say, are you really here? Are you seriously, do you exist? Because I'm not sure if you're, you're there or not, you know? That would be insanity. That would be a kind of insanity that you're talking to someone and you don't believe they're there, right? Well, I do agree it's insanity to ask somebody who's right in front of you and you're having a conversation with, do you exist and are you really here? I think that on the other hand, it's also pretty insane to have a conversation with somebody who doesn't exist and that you think is talking to you. So now they're in, it's in conversation with Allah and Allah asks a very direct question. Allah didn't ask the question, do I exist? He didn't ask that question because that's not a relevant question. He said, am I your master or not? Am I not your master? Do I not own you? Are you not my property? He asked that question. So God's asking them, are you my servants? Are you my slaves? Are you my bitches? Um, because an all-powerful God that can, by definition, lack nothing. He does not need anything. But he created slaves to serve him. Well, slave owners own slaves because they needed things to be done. Okay? They, they were a master because they needed things to be done that either they were too lazy to do themselves or it was just too much physical labor for them or just owning a lot of slaves to do all your work so you can get rich um, what need does an almighty God have with slaves why why would he need to be a master why can't he just create us to be who the fuck what we want to be you know that's a if that is the most important thing to him, if you are going to be his bitch, then I do not really want to follow that kind of God. I would answer no. I mean, if you did give me free will, which I hope 
you you admit that he did because if not then what's the point in asking them that question but asking them that question by assuming that they all have free will I would probably answer no I mean if, if I have a choice here then probably not I mean if I'm already created and I exist then why the hell would I serve an you know egomaniacal asshole like you and all of the ruh, the ruh of the believer, the ruh of the disbeliever, the ruh of the Christian, the ruh of the Jew, the ruh of the Kafir, the ruh of the Hindu, the atheist, the agnost, the pantheist, all of them together, all of them together had one answer. And the answer was, Bala Shahidna. Of course, we bear witness. We testify. So taking into account that every individual soul belongs to an unborn person, and every single one of them, without even one exception, said that they accept him as their master. That would tell me that they don't really have free will. Now, they might have free will and still every single one of those billions of souls has accepted unquestioningly that, that God is their master that I can't say that they don't have free will by that but it is very likely because it sounds like they were programmed to say that especially the way you describe it that they all um, stated it together so if they hear if they're programmed to answer in a certain way and they don't really have free will then what's the point in asking them a question to which you already know the answer and you know that all of them are going to answer that way. Why do you ask them that question if you program them to answer? It's like having a dialogue with yourself. Now we didn't just testify that he exists because that's not what he was asking them to testify to. He asked us to testify to something else. And what is that something else? What was the question? Who remembers? Call it out. This, is, uh, this hall has a lot of echoes, so you got to scream at the top of your lungs when you answer. What's the question he asked? Am I your master or not? In other words, it's not just when atheists talk about God, they talk about some entity that exists that has no relationship with you. But someone who owns you has a direct relationship with you. So he talked about a relationship. Do you and I not have a relationship? And what is that relationship? That I am the master and you are the slave. That is the question he asked. Am I the only one here who's thinking about BDSM references and stuff? I mean, all God wants to hear is, yes, master. That's the question that he asked us. And we all gave that answer. So now we know that he is master and we are slave. This ruh was inside of our bodies even when we were inside the body of our mothers. We were inside our mothers and Islam teaches us, the Prophet teaches us that the angel plucks a ruh, he takes a ruh and he delivers it inside the belly of your mother while you are still a fe inside the fetus. I'm still waiting for the selling point of your argument, dude. I mean, so far it's just assertions. You're just a fetus and it, it blows that ruh into you. 120 days into your mother's pregnancy with you. And so now, even before you're born, you believe that you are a slave of Allah. Your ruh does. Your mind, your brain hasn't developed yet. When a child is born, their, their vision is blurry. You know, they don't have muscular motion control. They don't know what their eyes and hands are doing. Babies, yeah, sometimes you have to put mittens on them because they claw their own face. They don't know. They don't have control over those things. This part of their intellect is developing. It's going to develop over time. Eventually, they'll have enough control in their limbs and enough balance that they can walk. And slowly, they'll start making words. And slowly, they'll start using the diaper. Right? They'll develop. And eventually, they'll evolve. But this ruh, this ruh, it was always there. Okay, here's the question. Is the soul or spirit or whatever you want to call it responsible for your logic decision-making and personality if you say that it is then how does it make any sense that there would be atheists and you actually clearly stated that it has nothing to do with your personality because this is like a robotic thing that accepts God because it was in its presence 
and doesn't really have free will, at least especially not as to whether God exists or not, whether to believe in God or not, because it was in its presence, it has no capability of disbelieving in God or not believing in God. So if it is responsible for your personality and decision making and logic, then there should have been no atheists and actually nobody from any religion whatsoever. And if it's not responsible for your actions, logic, decision making and personality, then why is it that that is what's held accountable for all the decisions that you made in your body? Why is it that you need that thing? I mean, why do you need a soul that has nothing to do with your personality and has absolutely no effect on you as a person? So, that's my question. And later on you're going to, to say that your personality, who you are, which is actually what this whole argument is about, that by knowing who you are, you get to know God. So, if that was true, then that means that who you are is that soul. And if who you are is that soul, then you're supposed to already accept God as your master since before you're born. Um, yeah, this is very unclear to me. So, you say that the soul is who you really are, who you, your personality and your cognition, basically. But before you said that it is not your personality. It was always there. And you will have to grow to a certain level before you can understand that there's this other thing inside you called the ruh. Let me, uh, let me throw this, you know, it's going to sound a little philosophical. By philosophical, do you mean dumb? Because since when is philosophy throwing out there a bunch of unbased assertions without any logic behind them or how you got to those conclusions? But let me throw this at you another way, okay? If I ask you, and I've done this experiment with school kids, I don't know how well this works with you guys, but let's try. If I ask you, where are you? Which seems like a silly question. I say, where are you? You point to yourself, you say, here I am, I'm right here. And I say, no, you're pointing at your chest. Where are you? Maybe if you ask that question to Muslims, but if you ask me, I will point right here. And then you say, me, right here. Oh, this is your body. Where are you? Where is you? This, this physical being of yours is going to get old and it's going to die, but you will still live. This is just an unbased assertion. How do you know that after you die, this keeps on living? You keep on living. And also, here is what I meant when I said that you're contradicting yourself, because at first you said that this Ruh has nothing to do with your personality, and you can't really explain what it is, you can't describe it and you can't point to it, because you were born with very little knowledge about what it is. And it's very hard to discover, because you have to get to a certain level to understand that you have one. But if that's you, then why do you need such a high level to understand that you have one? Besides, science already um, known for a while that who you are is in your brain. It's all in the wiring of your neural pathways. I mean, and there's plenty of studies that explain this. Now not enough is really known about how the brain actually works, but what's for certain is that all your decision making, all of your choices, and everything that you are, all your memories, and everything that makes you, all your experiences, are all stored in your brain. After your brain dies, none of that stuff stays. So, this is not only a an unbased assertion, but it's also false.